Today's Animal Spirits is brought to you by iShares by BlackRock. Ben, what what's the investing theme? I had to say investing because otherwise theme of 23 might be Taylor Swift. But what's the investing theme of 2023? Well, I've heard you and Josh I say that. Two. I said, I've heard you and Josh say that AI basically saved the market this year. So when Josh said that early in the year, I, I'm pretty sure I scoffed because he was early. That was like a Q1 statement, but I think he's right. Pretty sure he's right. It's possible. Uh, the, the funny thing is, is that like if this trend is what everyone thinks it's going to be, it's probably still early innings, which is hard to believe. Is that fair? Early innings. And t- well, I mean, well, yeah, ch- ch- we just got this damn be. thing. We just got right. this thing in November, in November, 2022. That's when Chad GPT hit the scene. So of course, of course, excuse me, all of this stuff is powered by semiconductors, which again, credit to Josh called them. I remember in like 2013, he's like, stop looking at the transports. Look at the semiconductors. Those are the new transports. Oh, semiconductors are the new transport. That makes sense. We obviously learned how important they are during the pandemic when we had a shortage of them, right? No yeah, one could get yeah. a car because semiconductors are so important. So year-to-date net inflows into the semiconductor subsector ETF, $1.8 billion. So that's, that doesn't sound like that much, actually. It feels kind of light. Anyway, if you're looking to get exposure to the burgeoning, the booming semiconductor space, but you're not into just picking individual winners. I don't know, NVIDIA, AMD, who's to say uh, which one is going to emerge uh, and, and take the reins. So the ticker for that is SOXX. To learn more about the iShare Semiconductor ETF, hit the link in the show notes. Welcome to Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben. Data, tons of data. Retail sales this morning, inflation last week. Speak, before you get into this, yeah. I, I was thinking... We do have an amazing amount of data at our, at our fingertips. Let's say the technology for podcasting existed, or we just had a radio show in like the 60s. What would we have talked about? Headlines? Would we have just read the newspaper? Because there, there was like literally no data back then for people like us. We would have had pages all over the place. No Google Doc. You know, those, remember those newspaper things where you, could, you had two sticks on the end in the library and you hold the sticks to hold two the newspaper sticks. up? I don't remember that. You never saw that? No. Like, it was like a little sleeve the newspaper would go into these huge long sticks and you'd hold the sticks so you could hold the newspaper open like a book. You never had that? No. Okay. You know, back in we, the day, did people just walk around with inky fingers from the newspaper? No. Huh. It's good. Probably. Hmm. Good point. Oh, you know anyway. what's gross? I don't know why I just thought about this. Uh, where did I see this? A temple. Handkerchiefs. How gross oh, are re- handkerchiefs? Reusing one? Yes. That is gross. No, but that, we, by we, definition, it's just a, it's just a, a tissue that I don't know. You just keep using and using and using. We've we've got a lot of stuffy noses in our household right now, and we're just going through boxes and boxes of Kleenexes. You know what I've got? A bad back, an achy back. For the first time since I started working out, I st- I started working out. The guy said, "What are you trying to get out of this?" And I said, "I don't want to hurt. I hurt my back sneezing, and I just don't want that to happen again." So it wasn't sneezing; it was playing basketball. But nothing even happened. It wasn't like I twisted wrong and I was like, ah! but all I of a sudden, I like, this would happen. Old men playing sports, it, it's like, shouldn't be a thing anymore, especially uh, basketball. I'm sorry. Well, I've been playing for a, a little while now. But you know that you knew this was coming. Well, whatever. Worth it. It's worth it. So okay. I couldn't get out of bed this morning. I'm heating. I got the heating pad going on. It's a whole thing. It's annoying. Yeah, but you're not middle aged. I'm not middle aged. Uh, yeah, all right. What kind of data we got here? Inflation. Year over year. Headline. The core, I don't know, it just keeps coming down, does it not? I mean, obviously, some, some parts are stickier than others, but as a whole, is this not trending in the right direction? You'd think so, but you wouldn't think so from listening to investment people because investment people continue to harp on this time is different, inflation is here to stay. And I don't, well, know, if, I don't know if they mean 3% instead of 2% or 4% instead of 3%. But that, that seems to be the resounding theme. And it's funny because a lot of people think they're contrarian when they say that. Like, hey, inflation. Should, I, think, I feel like everyone's saying that, though. I feel like, yeah, I think that's right. It does seem to be consensus. You know what's you know saying that uh, inflation is going to stick around longer? Although I don't know if, if that's exactly what this is saying. But interest rates are pushing to new highs really across the curve. Twos are at 4.85. The 10-year is at – no, that's the 10-year. I'm sorry. Twos are at 5.18. 10 years at 4.85. I don't know. Now, I'm not. Uh, but did you see retail sales this morning? The economy remains strong. Yeah. I'm sticking with my. What if rates are rising and it's and it's for a good reason? And that good reason is the economy 
remain strong. I still think people are not, everyone's, all the doomers out there think the consumer is going to be tapped out and they're just going to stop spending and that's going to be, that's going to make the economy roll over. I think it's going to have to be the opposite. People are not going to stop spending if they have a job. Like the, the, the questions people keep hitting their head against the wall on are why aren't housing prices falling and why is the economy not rolling over? And yeah, because, move on. It's because people have a job and people aren't going to stop spending if they have a job. It's that, I think it's that simple. I wonder if the eventuality that people are waiting for never happens and it's something else. So I don't know if you and I were talking about this or if Josh and I were talking about this. Did we already have a soft landing? Yeah, that was my thesis. That was weeks you? Ago. I, I said, yeah, I think you subliminally stole my take. Maybe. I'm but, sorry. We, do, we, we, we talk a lot. It There's happens. A lot, I, a lot of talk. I've stolen your takes. Yeah. I mean, I, I gave you the Bezos one that you got all the publicity for. I'll, uh, I'm willing. I'm willing to share my takes. <laughs> no, but I think that, I think that was a good one. Open source. So when you say <laughs> open source takes, not bad. <laughs> when you say that we already had a soft landing, that's not to say that we're we're in the clear, right? Like right. Uh, kumbaya, no worries. There's no risk. Of course, there's risk. But I think we might have already had the thing. Yeah, it's been it's been two years. Look at this. This chart is from the White House. It shows G7 countries which I think we're still trying to figure out what that means. Just developed countries. The US I'm sorry, has, that's, I'm sorry. That, that's not a mystery. That's, that's true. <laughs> the, but the US has the, what was the other one? We were, we we're trying to figure out one of those. But the US has the lowest inflation, this is as of August, of any of the G7 countries, which is crazy because somehow we were the cleanest dirty shirt for the whole 2010s coming out of the great financial crisis. And somehow it's this, the same thing coming out of the pandemic. Like people keep saying, like, how can the U.S. continue to dominate? And all these people are trying to predict, like, the end of the United States as, like, an, like the Roman Empire is falling. Yeah. I just, I don't see it. The U.S. continues to have the best innovation. We have, we have like, built-in buffers for, like, our borders and, like, and our response to the pandemic and to the great financial crisis, although not maybe exactly what people would have wanted, are way better than what happened to other countries. I'm sorry, but we're still king of the mountain, and I don't see anyone else knocking us off that throne. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, let me ask you this: Is the war on inflation over? You ready to say that? <sighs> Boy, Paul people Krug? were really people were really <laughs> mad at Krugman because he did CPI, X food, X energy, X shelter, and used cars. Because I guess those have been the most volatile things, and he said the war on inflation is over. We won at very little cost. I think people should have been more mad at the very little cost thing than the war on inflation is over. Yeah, that part is ridiculous. I, because I honestly, there obviously I was a cost. I don't know, Paul Krugman. Like, is he funny? Is he is he joking? Is he poking the trolls? I honestly can't tell. It would be it would almost be funnier if if he was like. Yeah, I wonder if he's if he's like this before. Like, I kind <laughs> of. <laughs> I I watched. I think you mentioned this. Uh, what was the movie? Get him to the Greek. Which. Oh yeah, he's been, in that. He's I, in I re, that. I rewatch it recently. It's so good. And jo I, I, I did too. Jonah, it, it's it's a little over the top, but Jonah Hill's like, hey, my dad loves your stuff or something. You know, I have uh, a fun fact. Uh, Paul Krugman grew up on the street that I live on. Oh, really? Actually, my neighbor uh, lives in his house. On Long Island, not in <laughs> Long Island, right? My neighbor lives in the house he grew up on. Oh, wow. Okay. But here's the thing. If he would have just said, here's CPI X shelter, this is a thing our friend Jeremy Schwartz has been harping on. He says using real-time series for shelter... Alt inflation, which is just because I think if you we've talked about the shelter component being a, a lagging indicator. If you look at it, Jeremy shows this here for Wisdom Tree: the trailing twelve month inflation with alternate sh uh, shelter metrics, which is taking like real time data for rents. And basically, what it shows is that inflation was way higher at the peak than we thought because of shelter and housing prices and rents going up, and it's way lower now. If you take shelter out of the equation and so he's saying it's below two percent already, and we should be we should be saying claiming victory here. Yeah, you don't have to X everything. Yeah, I mean, Cullen has this chart, CPI X shelter, and it's at two percent. Right, and I think that that that's the one that makes sense because that's that's also the biggest component of inflation. If you take that out and you say, well, listen, rents already rolled over; they're going negative year over year in some places. It does make sense, and and I think it all it also makes sense that inflation probably was higher than like the reported 9% we said because the shelter cost took a while to catch up back then. So is the interest rate breakout that we're seeing today, is this not necessarily inflation fears, but growth worries, which sounds dumb? Is it, is it growth? What's the opposite of worrying about growth? Well, maybe it's both, right? It's 
it's because I, I would the, assume is the market if, is the market excited about growth, and that's why yields are rallying. I mean, if the because thing is, the Fed's if, gonna have to stay tighter. I mean, if growth is yeah, if growth is gonna be higher, inflation is probably going to have to be a little higher too. We said this last week. I'm sorry, not even necessarily with the stock market, but like I can't. I'm not a I'm not a good news is bad news type of guy. I'm just good news is good news. It just is, right? Yeah, I'd rather keep- I'd rather the market go up. Uh, like you shouldn't be cheering for the market to go up on bad news. Yes, I agree. You don't that, want like that's like a short term, short term rush that's not sustainable. And it does seem like the market is like wavering on this. Sometimes when they have good economic news, the market takes off. Sometimes when there's good economic news, the market tanks. It's 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 hard to find that equilibrium of what's the what's the right place to be for the Fed to not totally stomp on the market's neck. You know who didn't get the memo that the war on inflation is over? Chipotle. Hello. It's over. Paul Krugman said it. Chipotle plan, plans price increases after pausing hikes this year. Uh-oh. Imagine the Fed is following Chipotle's footsteps. I had a what bad if, experience what if the, Chipotle what if the other day. Chipotle paused. The Fed paused. Chipotle hikes. What if the Fed hikes? So I, I, I do the order online so I can just walk in and pick it up and I don't have to wait in line. Yeah. You know? It's like I'm a VIP. And I did it the other day and I walked to the door at like noon and it was like a sign in the door saying, sorry, we're closed uh, temporarily. And I couldn't get my order. I already paid for it because it was on my app. I think I had to like email them and say, hey, listen. So yesterday I go to get it again and I called the place and I said, hey, I just wanted to make sure you're open. And the guy gave me attitude. He's like, yeah, of course we're open. I go, you weren't last week when I came in. And he's like, he didn't say anything. He just sat there. So I was not pleased with my customer service at Chipotle and now they're raising prices. Guess what? I'm still going to get it. I'm not going <laughs> to go on a strike like you. But wait, wait, did they did they give you a free order? Not free order. No. Did they make you pay for the second order? Yeah. Well, they they just refunded me. But yeah, it was whatever. Not a big deal. Another inflation question for you. We talked about semiconductors earlier. How is it possible that TVs keep getting so much better and cheaper? I It was like Amazon Prime Day last week, and I've been wanting to get... I used to have a TV in my little workout room. I created a little workout room during the pandemic in like my storage area. Nothing to nothing to brag about or write home about. It's I got like a Bowflex in there and a treadmill or whatever and some free weights. My back is still fine, by the way. <laughs> uh, and I wanted a TV in there and I wanted to hang it up on the wall just so I could have something in there to have sports on in the background or whatever. And I got a 43-inch TV. It's an Amazon Fire TV, like an insignia, like probably their lowest level of TV. It was $160 for a 43-inch TV. Now, is it the highest quality? Probably not, but for what I want to do with it, how is it possible that every single year TVs get better and cheaper? How that? Why wasn't there like an inflation scare with TVs at all over the past 24 months? They continue to get cheaper. Guess what? That TV is going to stop working in six months. Oh, I'm sure it is, but for what I want it for and I'm using it for... TVs it, keep getting cheaper. I don't know if they're getting better though. Like, you don't I think noticed, so? With the, the, I've the noticed smart on, TV stuff is not that... Not It's still relatively new. It's kind of like the iPhone. Like my, my TVs, and now at this point, they're all smart TVs with the apps. Every time like you click it to move around, I feel like it's getting a little bit slower. Like all of them. It's, it's they true. Start, they, 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 start out, they start out blazing fast and then they sort of deteriorate. But they're so cheap that once every four or five years, you just get a new one. Well, that's true. But I'm just saying like the first, the first flat, t- flat screen TV that I got, I remember it was like 37 inches and it was expensive. I saved it for a long time. I think it was like $2,300, but it lasted like 13 years. But these in things fact, are like computer, these things are like computers now. Yeah. So the old ones, they weren't as good, but they lasted forever. Like there was no deterioration. My Samsung, I'm everyone remembers three years ago. I got a lot, I got a lot of it after six months. I replaced it with the Sony, started out great blazings fast. And now it's, you know, it's, I click the button to move to the app and it's, there's a second and a half delay. Like it's, yeah, they are slow. It would be nice if you could like pay an extra 50 bucks for a faster TV or something, yeah. like, a, like an upgrade. But I, I still, I'm still really happy with the Samsung frame TV that look, it looks like a picture. Oh, uh, that's a beautiful TV. It, it, it looks really nice. So we got, we got retail sales this morning, as we mentioned, and I don't know if it's at an all time high, but I mean, it might as well be smoked, smashed expectations. July and August were both revised higher. This is what I get anytime I post economic news. Just wait for the revisions, but then no one talks about when the revisions get made higher. <laughs> True, that's a great point. Right? Like, like- hey, hey, let me let me let me say this. I was in the camp that these rates do take a while to filter through the economy, and we've kept, you know we've given all of the reasons why it hasn't, and I think everyone understands that. I'm almost 
but not quite, almost ready to say the economy can handle higher rates. The fact that it's been able to handle them this long, no one in their right mind would have ever said, sure, the economy can handle 8% mortgage rates and 5% treasuries. In, in, in it'll take 18 months to get there. No one, yeah. if you would have told people that, no one would have said, oh yeah, everything's going to be fine. Now, I'm not ready to pound the table on that. Like, I'm not going to fight you if you think I'm an idiot or that statement is dumb, fine. But what I would ask you, if you're if you're getting mad right now listening, is, is this. At what point in time would you concede? In other words, if it's April of next year and we're having these sort of same conversations with the consumers still spending, home prices aren't crashing. Like, if you have to, there has to be a, a, some point in time where you say, all right, hand up. Not Do you know happen. nothing of finance people? Finance people never concede anything. The goalposts are always moved out because, listen, it's just going to make the downturn even worse when well, listen, it happens. I can't control the group, the mob psychology, but I'm talking to the individual. If you're part of the group, hold yourself accountable. Give yourself a time frame where you say, you know what? At this point in time, I was wrong. I think that's what makes makes it so there's so many psycho doomers out there now because they have other people they can find. It's it's harder for them to change their mind because it's like a group. It was like the people with the AMC stock. Like, oh yeah, we're never when you, leaving. When you leave the group, you're a traitor. You're a sellout. Yes. Like, <laughs> changing, whatever happened. Changing whatever, your mind. What are you, an idiot? What happened to all the Diamond Hand AMC people? It's down like what, ninety nine percent? I think Taylor Swift basically put it back on life support with her movie, which I'm going to get to in recommendations. Father of uh, the year, right here. I'm just putting are, it out there. I'm you planting are a great, that seed. You are a great father. Uh, all right. Uh, so this is an interesting chart that we've shared before from Michael McDonough at Bloomberg. Department stores versus non-store retailers, so online. During the pandemic, there was the massive spike, right, when we were just ordering everything online. And then that has since come down and then bounced. And now we're, we're drifting back towards those highs. It looks like it's kind of on trend still. Department stores, on the other hand, crashed. And had like the tiny, tiny, tiny bounce, but they're still, it's, that's still secular decline. I'm never going to shop in a department store for the rest of my life. I can safely say that. Like as far as clothing or whatever goes, I will never buy something from a department store again. How's that? I, I only buy- you, you still do. Well, once a year, I go to Nordstrom's and I call you. Although last time I didn't call you, I just, I just, I did pretty good. However, yeah, but you're always like, Ben, how's this $350 shirt look? <laughs> Why is it so expensive? Well, then, then I put it back on the rack. Uh, but I did buy what I consider to be an expensive shirt. I bought a button up. Right. Because, yeah, the button down, the button down have the, the buttons on by the collars, right? That's a button down. This is what we learned. Yeah. So a button up is just a collared shirt. And it's probably the most money I've ever spent on a collared shirt. I think it was $200. And I lost it. I never wore it. How is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> How is that possible? It just came home. Are you serious? This is you with sunglasses. This is why you don't buy $200 sunglasses or $200 shirts. I don't, understand. Them. I don't understand how I could have lost that at my house. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> well, see, you're, you're helping keep the economy afloat by I mean, buying sure, stuff and losing it. I'm sure it'll pop up uh, some, at some point. Okay. This is a good anecdote from Pepsi. By the way, speaking of these anecdotes, uh, so I'm leaning on the transcript which has a phenomenal Substack. They shoot they shoot out emails of like inflation and macro and micro and consumer and technology and they just take like quotes from all of the uh, from all of the earnings calls. So if you're into that sort of thing, cannot recommend it highly enough. Okay, uh, this is from Pepsi CFO. Here's a great nugget. The thing that I usually look at with the consumer to, to detect whether there's high stress um, is the convenience store channel. Typically, when gas prices are up and consumer incomes are stressed, you see revenue in those channels under stress as well. For Q3, we saw revenue up 5% in beverages and up 8% in foods in the convenience channel. Uh, number two is food service. That's also typically a leading indicator. That's still growing double digits. This checks out, right? If you're at the gas station like and times are tough, you're not getting the nuts outrageous, which by the way is my favorite candy bar, or a hey, Diet Pepsi. It? A Diet nuts Pepsi in your rages? case. Nuts outrageous. It's a Reese's property. Okay. No, I, I, I like actually, the, we actually, I like the I Reese's a, fast break. I like it all. I, li I like the, the, the big cups. I like the mediums. I like the smalls. I like the pieces. I like them all. My kids love getting snacks at a gas station. So we, we're definitely helping this. I, I wanted to comment on the, the Pepsi Ozempic thing. I think you and Josh talked about this last week, but I just think people are really bad at calling trends and what's going to be the end of a company in advance. Like remember for like three weeks, people f literally thought Google was done. 
Like, listen, yeah. ChatGPT and Bing yeah. are going to take Google. And people really thought that Google sold off. And now Google's back to an all-time high, and it's kind of like nothing ever happened. But people were seriously saying, is this the end of Google? Which seems I mean, this is this is dumb. This is, this, is, this, is a, this is an obvious overreaction. Not in the Ozempic thing. People I think are not going to stop thing. being. People are not going to stop being unhealthy. Like who's kidding who? No, I, I, I have a hard time seeing that too. All right, this is from Fortune Magazine. Jamie Dimon talking about the war in Israel. The war in Ukraine, compounded by last week's attacks on Israel, may have far-reaching impacts on energy and food markets, global trade, and geopol- geopolitical relationships. This may be the most dangerous time the world has seen in decades. He said. I'm sorry. What do you talk about in the third quarter earnings report? Is this not not to discount the the tragedies that we're seeing? But is this not recency bias? Yes, and I think, but I, I think people see this kind of stuff and these kind of headlines, or see the geopolitical stuff, and assume that they they need to do something with their portfolio because of it. And I think that's a big mistake to try to conflate anything going on in geopolitics with your por- portfolio because most of the time it's very counterintuitive what happens to the economy or the markets when something like this happens. And, and you assume, well, I need to keep my hands in the steering wheel now and do something because this seems bad. I think that's a huge mistake for investors. Agreed. All right. Uh, I read my first Howard Marks memo in a while. Investing for a sea change. You reading his stuff still or not? Uh, it's been a while. Okay, so he did the whole you know, thing where he... So, so, somebody, somebody, I, I read a great quote years ago. Like, something about like, it, like you should, you should graduate from your mentors. Like that's a good thing. That's a healthy right. thing. And I think so many investors, myself included, uh, have learned so much over the years from Howard Marks. Right. People like right? Buffett and Marks, you don't read them as religiously anymore. Yeah. Like I just, it's same thing with Buffett. I mean, I know what they're going to say. And sometimes, in fact, oftentimes it's worth a reminder, but uh, to answer your question, no, I have not read him. So he went, he went through this while. whole thing about a sea change is his big thing. And he talked about how we've gone from this same thing I said as consensus now. We've gone from a period of low rates and low inflation to high rates and high inflation. And it's, and it's going to be harder for people who own assets that benefit. And he's saying that that's what the sea change. He's a bottom line. If this really is a sea change, meaning the investment environment that has been fundamentally altered, you shouldn't assume the investment strategies that have served you best since 2009 will do so in the years ahead. He says, S&P 500 has returned 10% per year for almost a century, and everyone's happy. He says 10% a year for 100 years turns a dollar into $14,000. Not bad. Compounding. Nowadays, the ICE B of A U.S. High Yield Constrained Index offers a yield of 8.5%. The CS Leverage Loan Index offers 10%. Private loans offer considerably more. In other words, expected pre-tax yields from non-investment grade debt investments now approach or exceed the historical returns from equity. To me, this means allocators should ask themselves, what are the arguments for not putting a significant portion of our capital into credit today? It is kind of crazy how high the... So I looked at some high-yield bond ETFs. It's like HYG and JNK. They're both yield... Average yield maturity is 9, 9.2%. And I asked you and Josh this morning on Slack, like, what's the argument against this? And I know that the easy one is we go into recession and spreads blow out and these things get killed. But 9% yields on high-yield is pretty... That sounds like a pretty darn good deal, right? What's yeah, the, so, what's the so, counter here? So let, let's look through this. So you could say, all right, I'd rather, I'd rather just, I'd rather just wait for spreads to widen and for some defaults to pick up because we haven't seen that yet, and then I'll buy when yields get to twelve percent, thirteen percent. You know what the average? Um, I looked this up last week. You know what the average default rate is in high yield? Four percent. Like yeah, three to five basically. Uh, so you could say I'd rather hide out in cash, but if you're like an equity investor, if you want to take some from your equity sleeve, you could say. But if there's if there's uh, a credit event or a recession, high yields going to fall 25, 30%, right? But guess what? So, d- so, it's a, during the so, so it's the stock market. And at sure. least with high yield, at least with high yield, you, you have a 9% buffer. So yeah, I think that, I think you can make a case for high yield for sure. So in the in the pandemic, high yield fell 23%. And it and it bounced back really quick, just like the stock market. But the the timing is the thing that gets you on these because let's say you are going to wait. I'm going to wait for spreads to blow out, then I'm going to buy high yield. But what if it doesn't happen for two years and then you missed out on 18% in yield in the yeah. meantime, yeah, yeah, yeah. which kind yeah. of makes up for the loss. Yeah. So I, I don't know. Bond yields approaching 10% with a relatively low default rate. And I know a lot of these high yield companies are maybe going to feel more pain because rates are higher now and maybe the default rates raise a little bit. But I don't know. That sounds like a pretty darn good deal to me. For, for if it's, like you said, kind of like an equity sleeve type of situation, I, th- I think that's... Well, how about this? Man. How about this? 
I remember not too long ago when high yield was yielding like 5%, literally. Right. And people were saying this is insane. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right now actually is, is more, a little more normal, I think. Yeah. If, if there is such a thing. You saw this chart being shared around. Uh, half of all, this is from Goldman Sachs, half of all publicly listed firms by profit margin, half of all stocks have no profits. Meaning the profit margin is, is negative. I was going to say this is going to, this is going to correct pretty quickly, but maybe not. I don't know. So here's, here's the, the follow-up why this chart doesn't really matter. Uh, it's like less than 10% of these companies by revenue share. So the companies who make the most money, 90% of them, 90% of the companies that make the most money have positive margins. So the point is that these companies that have such low profit margins are very tiny in the grand scheme of things. Well, it matters if you're an investor in them because well, these companies are getting destroyed. But don't you, don't you think though, that this, this is the kind of thing that isn't going to mean revert and it's probably going to stick around because of technology and which or, part, or you think which part having more companies that don't make a lot of money, that the market is more forgiving for that. Or do you think that's going to, no, reverse? that's over. The market is not forgiving for companies that don't make any money. All those companies got mangled. It is kind of crazy how, I mean, it was less than 10% in 1960 and now it's 50%. Is this also a reason why we've had these discussions in the past where there was 7,500 publicly traded companies in the 70s, and now there's 3,500 or 3,000? And maybe one of the reasons for that, besides all the consolidation of these things, is that a lot of these companies just simply wouldn't have made it anyway? Yeah, maybe. I also wonder if there's another part of the story is that these companies are never, not never, these companies, um, there's an exit strategy for these companies, which is M&A. So they right. don't necessarily need to survive and become profitable for there to be sure. a successful outcome for the investors, yeah, they just right? Need a because company to take them over. Think about the the Mobis and piece about market activity with IPOs. Like M and A is still the dominant theme. Yeah, yeah. And so a lot of these, I'm guessing that like a lot of M and A happens with these companies that have negative margins. I could be wrong, but that would just be a guess. So Data Trick, uh, Nick Colas, uh, research company had this chart. I really like it. It's, it compares the current long term treasury bear market to the 2000 to 2002 bear market in stocks and then the 2007 to 2009. I'm just saying I think I made I think I, I think I made this chart first. You made this? Okay. I shared it with you I shared it with you and Josh last week. Oh, I didn't realize you put it on the same thing. Did you? I did. Yeah, I did. Okay. I didn't have the, I didn't did. have okay. I didn't have 2008. Okay. Yeah, but did you have the the red writing on there like that? I did not. So my the, the point that I that I that I made that I'm I'm actually using this chart the one that I made for what are your thoughts tonight is that as we mentioned, TLT, it's a longer and deeper drawdown than 2000, uh, than the dot-com bust. But what I did was I looked at like the worst days compared to the worst days for the Qs. Oh, not even close? Not really even close. But the thing that's, that is, I think, most surprising is just the fact that it's lasted longer. Because that was a, that 2000 to 2002 bear market was a really, really long, that took forever. It's, it's just surprising that it's lasted, lasted longer. Uh, this is an interesting... If you're looking for asymmetry in the market, uh, Katie Greenfield from Bloomberg, she looks at the 12-month expected returns if yields rise or fall, and she looked at di three different scenarios: if they uh, 50 basis points, 150, or 300 basis points if they rise and fall. So, for instance, a 10-year Treasury or 30-year Treasury, if rates rise 300 basis points from here, which would be crazy, rates long-term rates will go to eight percent. If that happens, back up the truck and buy 30-year Treasuries for everything, right? Just do the 50 basis point rise and fall. Okay, sorry. That's 50, 50 basis points uh, for the 30 year, you would you would lose three percent. If three if if they fell 50 basis points, you'd rise 13 percent, more than 13. <laughs> you'd rise. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but it's it's showing that like a, a, a rise in rates right now is you you lose a little money, but if rates fell by that same magnitude, you'd make a lot more money. The duration thing is flip flopped. I think you could buy this not out of long term bonds, even like. Yeah, rates might go up. So hold on, where's that chart again? So if rates go up another 100 basis points, I'm ballparking this. You're going to lose 10%. Okay. You could lose 10%, right? But you'll get paid back. And if rates fall, uh, you'll do exponentially well. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I still, like, I, I don't know. I, I, I shy away from 30. Look, even the 10-year, if 10-year yields rose 150 basis points, you're losing 6%. If they fell 150 basis points, you're gaining 16%. That's a pretty good really trade-off. Good. Really good, yeah. Right? Uh, this is interesting. This is another one from Goldman Sachs. Ownership breakdown of U.S. Treasury market. We talked last week about, like, supply and demand being maybe the big thing that's causing yields to be messed up besides the economy. And they show households only own 9%. Passive funds own 2%, active funds own 10 The biggest owner of U.S. Treasuries is foreign investors at 30%, and that's falling a little bit. Look at the Federal Reserve, though. They actually owned more Treasuries in the 70s than they do now. Hmm. Or it looks like maybe similar, but they own 18%. I just have to imagine if the Fed wants to get control of the Treasury market, I think they're just going to have to become a bigger piece of it. And kind of like, you know how Japan, the Bank of Japan basically buys all their bonds now? I honestly think if if like the treasury market gets crazy all the time, the Fed's going to have to take a bigger and bigger role. People will like that. All right. Last week, I just I found this tidbit interesting. Last week, we showed like the Bank of America bond thing going back to like the 1800s, like the worst bear market going back to 1800 or whatever. And there, the longest bear market was in 1835. And so I had to look at it. I said, what what caused this bond bear market from 1835 to 1839? Those are the vigilantes. President Andrew Jackson achieved his goal of entirely paying off the United States debt. It was the only time in history that the national debt stood at zero, and it, particip- <laughs> it precipitated one of the worst financial crises in American history. <laughs> I thought it was hilarious that he literally paid off the entire debt, and it led to like a six-year depression. <laughs> like, kind of like, careful what you wish for, people. I don't know. I just, I just thought that was pretty funny that like they literally paid the entire debt off. That was his goal, and it led to a huge depression. For like so six years. somebody on Twitter at Austin tweeted, would you invest in this company? Annual expenses, 6.4 billion up 1.5% year over year. Annual revenue, 4.8 billion up down 2% year over year. Net loss, $1.5 billion. Outstanding debt, $25.8 billion. And you're like, well, no, of course you wouldn't invest in this company. Change the billions to trillions. And this is the financial status of the United States federal government. And Elon Musk tweeted, replied to him, yikes. And then, of course, you can imagine what the comments section in here looked like. I don't, I, I don't understand this line of thinking. I mean, I, I get what I get what they're saying that this is unsustainable, but the United States government, needless to say, is not a corporation, and you don't invest in them. Well, here's the problem, though. You're showing debt. How much is the United States military? Actually, I guess you buy, you do invest worth. in the United States with the debt. I guess you do. Hell yeah! If if I'm yeah. investing in a company that can literally print its own money, yes, I'm investing in that hand over fist. I, 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 we're already, I'm long America for sure, but he shows the debt, but he doesn't show the assets. You know how much money, how much land the government owns? How many monuments? Um, how much do you think they can sell? Monuments. That's true. How much do you think? The Statue of Liberty has got to be worth a couple of 10, 20 million. How much could we sell the Washington Monument for? I'm the, the military, the ability to print their own money. I get it. I, I was actually at a speech one time and a guy did this thing where he said, if the U S government was a household, this is the credit card debt. And he went through it all. And some guy in the, in the, uh, comment section. A, yeah. <laughs> Some guy at the conference raised his hand and just destroyed this guy. It was like a Colin Roche type of guy. Just destroyed him and put him in his place. And the guy, like, he had no comeback. He's like, I, I just thought it was funny. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do wonder if this is going to become, a, uh, as we approach the elections, if this is going to become more and more of a political thing, the, de- the debt. I mean, it, the debt I think it, yeah. is crazy. I, I don't know how it matters. I also don't, don't know how it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Yes. With, with higher rates. It, it, we said at the time, like, listen, if rates are 3%, the debt doesn't matter as much. With rates at 5%, it matters yeah, a lot more. I yeah, think. it matters. I, I, I don't know how this, you know, I don't know where and how it matters, but I can't imagine it not mattering. All right. I thought this was a pretty good take from Connor Sen. Over the past year, inflation has come down a lot. Real growth has been solid. Real wages are up, which again, a lot of people probably don't know about. Oil production is up. Gasoline prices are down. Rent growth is minimal. Supply chains have healed. And yet, because of interest rates and financing costs, the vibes are still bad for many. I think, like, I talked in the past about how, well, the average rates in the 90s were higher than they were today. Same thing in the 80s. And the economy did great in the 80s and 90s. But I think there's something to the psychological impact of anchoring to way low rates and then going higher versus going way higher and going lower. So, like, even though average rates were higher in the past and the economy sloughed it off, I think psychologically, people can't wrap their minds around these types of financing costs when they can look back so recently in their memory and say, well, wait, I used to be able to borrow for this. I think that's, I think psychologically, that's the biggest problem now is the quick change in rates from such a low level. I think that's going to have 
an impact for a while. I, I, like if, if rates do stay higher for longer or whatever, people will eventually get used to them. But I think for a while, it's going to take, the, I think the vibes are going to constantly be off. But so much of the, so, so many people from in the economy are insulated from higher rates. Like has, have higher rates personally impacted your life? Not at all. So, like at all. I mean, yeah, maybe I would like take more money on my home equity line of credit or something, but I don't, what, do I, what would I do with it? So, so for, for most, obviously not all, but a lot of people have a mortgage below 5%, pay off their credit card. Higher yes. interest rates don't impact me at all. And it, I, right. this is not like, a, I'm not like, oh, what are the privileged ones? I mean, I am one of the privileged ones, but there's, there's oh, tens of millions of people like this that no, aren't the impacted. The home ownership rate in this country is 66%. Guess what? The majority of the people already own their home and have low financing costs locked in. So it really sucks for people who are first-time home buyers or people who are changing jobs and moving or whatever, but that's a very small percentage of the population. Now, I know, I know the cost of capital impacts everything, right? So even if it doesn't directly impact me, I know it impacts me, but I, I don't know. I'm having trouble squaring the circle of why the quote vibes are bad. And I was thinking like, I don't know if it's a social media thing, but I don't, I don't think that it is. I don't think that's what this is because if you just look at like small business surveys and things like that, like it, it vibes aren't great. No. But I also wonder if this is this, this, the new world that we live in where surveys will never reveal things as positive. Is that possible? Right. Yeah. That we're just, this is just that a new world. And is it also possible that the pandemic just threw the vibes off too? We went through this really crazy thing. D doesn't it, I feel like there is like a, you know, they, like the calendar thing that's like the BC and AD thing. Like it just has that break point. I feel like the pandemic for me is that like I. Excuse me? The what? Like going back to year zero, it's like BC, like 10,000 oh, BC, sorry. right? I'm sorry. Yes. I feel like the pandemic is like that in my life. I, yeah. I anchor to that pandemic starting point of like before then and after then. Yeah. And I feel like after then, I think it really screwed a lot of people up psychologically and mentally. Going vibes through are dead. Experience. Vi vibes are dead to me forever. I don't trust them. They're the vibes are the new surveys. And I know right, we're so an anti vibes, vibes podcast. What's that? We're an anti vibes podcast. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think we are. That's right, yeah. Ben. I think we are. Remember all of the tech and fintech layoffs? Yes, ten thousand every day. And so that was like just the beginning of the rolling recessions that we were seeing. We saw a lot of layoffs in financial services, specifically in the mortgage departments. And it was just going to keep rolling through the economy and it was going to hit this sector and then leisure and then hospitality and then building and manufacturing and all this and that. Well, not really. This chart is kind of crazy that it, it just, it just, it rose and then it fell. It was like companies anticipated a recession. And I guess you're right. There probably was a mini recession in the technology industry, but then it just rolled over and stopped and it didn't, it didn't go elsewhere. That is surprising. What, what's this YouTube comment? Oh, we, we talked about how sometimes the best thing that can happen to you is a job you didn't get. And this person says, it was 2007, I was pissed at a certain prestigious company that didn't want to interview me because I had a different engineering degree and they needed a different one, even though the coursework was 95% the same. They paid a starting salary of 75K, which was a solid salary for a new grad. Yeah, it was. I made $256. Fast forward to 2008, a couple months into starting full-time work elsewhere, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. So this guy was so mad he didn't get hired at Lehman Brothers in 2007, right out of college, and realized it was probably the best thing that ever happened to him. Not bad. Mm. All right. So yesterday, who was the crypto coin telegraph or something? There's all these Co crypto coin publications. I can't. They in the morning tweeted out, "iShares crypto ETF has been approved by SEC." Right? Something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And then people went crazy. Bitcoin spiked 10%. And then they issued reportedly, right? Like they, they changed, edited it to <laughs> reportedly. <laughs> and then all these other people who actually follow this stuff, Eric Belchunas and some of these other Bloomberg people and are like, hey, listen, I can't verify this. This doesn't, this doesn't sound, something doesn't smell right here. And apparently it wasn't. And then Bitcoin fell right back down. Here's my question. Like, from no, no, it didn't. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. It didn't fall right what back down. I mean, if you look at the chart, like it's still up pretty substantially. It's at twenty eight thousand four hundred. What was it before? But it it fell. It wasn't at thirty though. No, but on on Saturday it was at twenty six eight hundred. But yes, the, the 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 spike from twenty eight to thirty came back down. My efficient market thing, like it's it's a when not an if for a Bitcoin ETF being approved. Like we, it's going to happen. Yeah. So so why would 
if if Bitcoin took off 10%, why would it just stay there if it knows the Bitcoin ETF is coming at some point? Like the market should price this kind of stuff in, should it not? Why is it not priced in? Yeah, that, I, I was I was playing ping pong in my brain. Like, obviously, Bitcoin's gonna pop when the ETF gets announced. But, but then the other, we but know then the other side was like, but if everyone knows it's coming, why would it pop? And then it's like because it's gonna pop because people are dumb. It may, that maybe that's it. It's so it, it's so dumb. It makes no sense. Like. It it should be at the prices like if Ben like, Ben you have to remember that Tesla was up like ten percent when they announced the stock split. All right, so that's a, that's a valid point. Like if well if it gets not if it gets announced again, are we going to go up another ten percent? Probably. It just it makes like just stay there then. It makes no sense. Uh, I don't know. What, what really surprised me, I, I almost, I almost couldn't believe it. Um, Larry Fink went on Fox Business and said the rally today is about a flight to quality talking about crypto and he, he lumped, he grouped crypto in with treasuries and gold. Really? How did this happen? The funny thing is that there really hasn't been a huge flight to quality or safety in gold. The gold was down in 2021. It was basically flat last year. I guess you could say that helped and it's up 5% this year. There hasn't been like a huge influx of investors into gold that you would think with the government spending and all this stuff people are talking about. Interesting take, though. Sorry, I do want to play this. This rally is way beyond the rumor. I think the the rally today is about a flight to quality with all the, you know, all the issues around the Israeli war now, um, global terrorism, and I think there's more people running into a fl flight to quality, whether that is in treasuries, gold, or crypto, depending on how you think about it. And I believe crypto will play that type of role as a flight to quality. That's almost unbelievable to me. I mean, listen, BlackRock manages, I don't know, 11, 12 trillion, 10, whatever the number is. You really think that he's talking like this so that they get $50 billion into a Bitcoin ETF? Hey, credit to Larry, the consummate salesman. I almost give him credit <laughs> for this one. That's, he's, he's making a pitch. <laughs> I, I don't know. I guess. I was just, I mean, I, that was, that was uh, surprising. Oh, right, let's talk about real estate. 6.8% uh, of listings had price drops. This is the largest number of price drops in October over the last four years, but barely. And I saw a data point that, damn it. Still I, way I, lower than it seems like it should be. There was, a, there was a price drop either nationally or in some markets of like 0.1%. I looked, we're, we are starting to get more supply where I, I did a quick Zillow search in my area last week. And there's, there's starting to be more houses on. It's just... The prices are so much insanely higher, and I feel like people are still not going to be willing to drop prices. I was talking with somebody in my town the other day, like, I don't, this doesn't make any sense. Prices are going to crash, right? I'm like, dude, look around. Yeah. There's no houses. Right. Th That's there's the thing. Like, it's, 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 like a there's, it's like collusion. Like, if everyone lists their house for a higher price and no one decides to ever, like, lower the bar, it's, I don't know. When is it, how, how is well, it going to happen? But let me ask you this. I was gonna, just going to say, how literally do prices correct the way that people think they are? It has to be a fire sale of someone who can't afford their mortgage anymore. People aren't going to panic leave their house. Right. It's not like a stock where it's, it's down after an earnings report and you go, get me out. It doesn't work like that. There's just no supply. And I, I honestly don't see that dynamic. I don't know what would cause that dynamic to change. <sighs> right. Uh, from Bloomberg, typical families spent 27.3% of their income on their annual mortgage payment, which actually to me sounds relatively low. Like I think 30 to 32% is usually the number. Uh, qualifying income for a new mortgage, though, based on a 20% down payment was $107,000 to make, marking the third straight six-figure reading. So that, that's the haves and the have-nots. It's fine if you already had a mortgage. It's not if you didn't. I want to talk about the 70s and 80s housing market. I looked into this a little bit, looking at like what's – people are saying that like housing prices are going to crash. And we talked about Josh's take last week that like, actually, that'd be a good thing. It would drive up economic activity. Pent up demand would come off the sidelines. But I looked at like, I think the worst case scenario is if prices don't correct a little bit. So the 70s, a lot of people don't realize this. Stocks underperformed inflation. Bonds underperformed inflation. Cash was the only thing that was slightly positive on, an, on a real basis. The only thing for like the middle class that was up in the 70s was housing. Housing prices are up 130%. Now that's before inflation, but... And you could have bought gold, I guess, but you would have probably had to have like coins in your safe or something. It was not easy to buy gold back then. So housing for the middle class in the 1970s is when it really took off as like an asset for people. 
and mortgage rates never got as low, never got lower than 7.2% in the 70s. And they ended the decade at like 10%. And then they went from 10% to 19% in 19, from 1980 to 1981. And guess what? Housing prices didn't fall. So housing prices were up 130% in the 70s. And then over the course of the 70s and 80s, they were up 300%. And that's in a time when mortgage rates averaged 11% and got as high as 19%. And housing prices never rolled over. They fell for a slight time on a real basis, but nominally, housing prices did not fall for that two-decade period. And I think, I'm not saying like housing prices are going to continue to take off because we've already pulled forward so many gains, but I think that's the that's the nightmare scenario for people is housing prices just refuse to roll over, even yeah, not, in the face of higher rates. Uh, I don't think anybody wants that. I, but I think that unless we just build more houses somehow, pull them out of thin air, I don't see what changes the dynamic. Uh, all right, let's do great quarter, guys, real quick. Here's some Delta. Our expectations for full year revenue growth of 20% over 2022. Robust demand for travel on Delta is continuing into the December quarter, where we expect total revenue growth of 9% to 12%. Ooh, that Compar- would be a good search on quarter, robust. I bet that word gets uh, thrown yeah. on a lot. Here's a good one. Weighted average interest rate. Okay, we spend a lot of time talking about how insulated the corporations are. Weighted average interest rate of 4.5%. With 89% fixed rate. Wow. Even for a company like Delta, who ran into a ton of problems in the pandemic, right? That's, yeah, that's not bad. JP Morgan, Connor Swent, sent tweeted this. Where are we seeing softness in credit? Nowhere. At least nowhere that's expected. That's, I'm sorry, at least nowhere that's not expected. Nothing? Okay. Uh, I, no, it's, uh, it's the funny thing. The funny thing is, is that like the bank CEOs forever. And I don't, I keep, I, I hate to keep like harping on diamond, but it's like the hurricane is coming. The hurricane is coming. And it's like, how's your business? Fine. No problems at all. Every, everyone keeps spending money and there's like no delinquencies and things are okay. Um, all right. BlackRock. Uh, this is the CFO rate hikes over the last 18 months mean that for the first time in nearly 20 years, clients can earn a real return on cash. In the short term, that has benefited many portfolios. Investors have been able to generate positive returns while waiting for inflation to cool and for more policy certainty from central bankers. This waiting has weighed on industry flows, including here at BlackRock. Investors are being paid to wait. Yes, they so are. So they're they're saying they're seeing flows into probably T bills and money markets and short term treasuries and that yeah. sort of stuff. Yep. All right. Survey of the week. We've got two this week actually. Uh, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, is reclining your beha- your airplane seat upright behavior or downright rude? Now, there's two schools of thought. School one is it's my seat. I paid for it, a lot of money for it. I, if I want to recline, I can recline. School two is, well, yeah, but it's rude. Like it's just rude. Uh, and I'm in school two. I, I have I don't think I've ever reclined my seat because uh, I don't like when people do it to me. And the worst like- is when you have like your laptop out or something and they recline it yeah. back and it like yeah. I live by a very simple rule. Treat people how you want to be treated. And so that's why I don't recline. All right. Reclining advocates. Oh, I already said that part. Uh, Okay. In a recent survey of 1,100 Americans, uh, 46% said it is rude to fully recline and that they don't recline. 28% said it was rude and they would politely ask if it was okay before reclining. And 23% said it wasn't rude. That's not sounds all right to me. Three out of four people think it's rude. One out of four people don't. I think that that's about what I would have expected. I don't know why this made me laugh. Just the picture of the article of the CEO of Delta just sitting on an empty plane, <laughs> yeah. smiling awkwardly. Uh, all right, I've never a, heard anyone ask if they can recline, though. Hey, I don't is it think okay it, if I recline my chair. Yeah, I think. Who, who, what is that? Twenty. Okay, so twenty-eight percent uh, said it was rude, and they would probably ask if it was okay. But all right, so twenty-eight percent of the country are liars. Nobody asks. You're right, Ben. True. No Here's way. a great survey from John Huber. Buffett described Apple's customer value and pricing power by posing a hypothetical question. Uh, if you were offered $10,000 to never buy an Apple product again, do you take that deal? Nope. 49% of people said no. I say no. $10,000, a lot of money. I need, the, I need the Apple products. I'm hooked. Duncan is, Duncan's a recliner. He said it's the airline's fault for cramming people in there. Wow. D- Duncan's like sneakily rude. <laughs> Duncan's got a little bit of a, of a, of something in him. I don't know what the he word said, I'm looking for is. Duncan, you want to come on and def- Duncan, come on and defend your honor. He's too crammed in. Duncan, you're you're not a big guy. <laughs> I really don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you're the one out of four. 
Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, this is good news. More than 71 million Americans receiving Social Security benefits will see their checks rise by 3.2% next year to help them keep pace with inflation. And last year uh, it was like 8%, wasn't it, or 9%? So average benefit is $1,900. That's not nothing. No. It continues to be the best retirement program that there is. Okay, real quick on parenting from Derek, Tom, Derek Thompson. There was a study done. This is more of an opinion piece than a study. Our thesis is that a primary cause of the rise in mental disorders for kids, because a lot of people are trying to figure this out, like why are kids so unhappy these days, is a decline over decades in opportunities for children and teens to play, roam, and engage in other activities independent of direct oversight and control by adults, more or less saying it's helicopter parents that are causing kids to be mentally unstable. I, There could be some of this, like kids, parents put more pressure on kids today. I think that's that's almost a certainty. Oh, absolutely. I was at the pumpkin patch the other day, and it's crazy. I saw some lady like hysterical freaking out, like Timothy, Timothy, and like, <laughs> and, and not to listen. I, I know losing a kid is terrifying. Yeah, he he was he was right behind her. Yeah, we lost my son in Again, the grocery he, store. Once. She turned around. He was he was directly behind her, and she's like, oh, "You scared me!" And, and I, I just, he was right. My, behind my her. son would like he would bolt in the. I'm surprised we never lost on a mall or something. But it, at the grocery store, he ran back to where all the they store all the food and bring it in and stuff. He like ran to the doors and we couldn't find him like frantically running around the thing. He was fine. I don't really think this is the, I think part of, I think honestly kids are just, uh, have more access to information and stuff these days in the screen stuff. I think it's, I think it's all internet based that in the past we were, I mean, yeah, but we, it's the same we, thing. Internet is the same thing. It's it's the same thing. Yeah. Well, this is saying like helicopter we're, parents, but I, I just think it's, it's kids. know. I don't think, I don't think we were meant to know so much about what's going on in the world. For, at such an early age. And I think I think kids are just, they, they know what's going on more than, than people did in the past. Agreed. Culture Critic tweeted, once upon a time in the 1950s, a family could own a home, a car, and send the kids to college all on one income. What went wrong and how can it be fixed? Holy moly. I don't know. Yeah, I feel this like is, this, this one gets debunked once a month, I feel like. Yeah. Okay, like, well, what's, what's the debunking? Wait. Way fewer people went to college back in the day. That's the thing. Uh, houses were way smaller, uh, which is another thing. The home ownership rate was actually lower. I think if you look through each of each one of these, you, you could go point by point and show why it never actually was this. And people have this nostalgia for a time that didn't exist. Most households didn't have two cars. They do now. It's like all these things where things are much better today, but people don't want to realize it. Oh, also, back in the 50s, People couldn't be miserable with their lives because of social media. So there's that. There is that. So I got a call the other day from Robin, and she was like, did you send Logan to school with a peanut butter sandwich? I'm like, yeah, he, what? She's like, you can't send peanut butter to a preschool. Oh, they, he got yelled at for it or reprimanded? <laughs> I mean, he didn't. But you did. You he did. did. Right. Because obviously, you know, I, I, peanut. There's a peanut salad. Peanut allergy is like a huge thing. Well, that's interesting because we have like a peanut free, but we actually send our kids with peanut butter and jelly all the time. Really? And, and we got one of the allergic. My son, he's allergic to like uh, cashews and pistachio. Pistachios really bad. But who? What kid brings cashews and pistachios to school? I do like a good cashew. I like pistachios too. We can't have them anymore. Hmm. He gets like violently ill. Maybe the fifties were better. Uh, Kobe loves every day. He's bringing home a new book. It's like animals versus animals, uh, scorpion versus tarantula. Like who would win in a death fight? Mm -hmm. Apple doesn't fall far from the tree. That, I could see you doing that you, for sure. You, you know how I feel about uh, imagine like the Meg versus well, actually in the Meg too. It's a Meg versus a giant octopus. I loved it. Who would win? I don't know. I'm guessing the Meg won. The Meg won. Or would the Meg really win? It was a good fight. Uh, all right, I, Ben, I, I met somebody in future proof that I followed up with and his assistant sent me an email back saying, uh, they would love to catch up. Uh, do you have any, but their, their, their schedule is busy or whatever. Do you have any time in November? Now I'm pretty positive that this was like two or three weeks ago. That's a busy person. I mean, that's just, that's, is that incredibly rude? That is, I don't value your time very much, but that's getting to Thanksgiving-ish. Like, let's uh, let's circle back after the holidays kind of thing. That's like an early circle back after the holidays. But I'd rather, I, I think I'd rather 
the assistant, which made me feel a little bit even worse, have said like, uh, Timothy is very busy. He'll circle back. Like that would have been fine. But like, yes, he's let's gonna put find a place for you. Put something on the calendar in November. It's like, we'll just say he doesn't want to meet. Right. <laughs> like True. he could meet in 40 days. What? No. Uh, all right. I got this email. Hi, Michael. Happy Thursday. Oh, and th- you know what? Credit to this person. The subject line was Michael question mark. So I'm like, oh, Michael. They're okay. getting smarter. Yeah. What do they, what do they want? Hi, Michael. Happy Thursday. I was searching for wealth management firms that came across your site. I noticed some simple changes you can implement to make the design and functionality 10 times better. Would you be opposed to receiving a completely free website mock-up? Well, actually, yes, I would be opposed to that. But then here's what got me. P.S. Because you, you, you read all this, and you're like, oh, this is just computer generated, right? Yeah. And this is probably a computer generated tool. In fact, it must be. P.S. Cool to see that you graduated with a bachelor's degree from Queens College. I can only imagine how much work you put in. <laughs> yeah. What a ba- what a backhanded compliment. Yeah. Tons of work. Oh my god, I never worked so hard in my entire life than when I had to. But anyway, but that but that also is pre-fill too, right? They just they just scrape the college I, and I have to imagine. It's uh, pretty good though. All right, Ben, I got some recommendations. It's still Halloween season. I'm still cranking out horror movies. So I I saw one, I guess this was on Netflix, I think. It's called Haunt. Got a hundred percent from the audience. 70% from the toma- from the uh, critics. Now, Fewer than 50 verified ratings. That's eh, like a eh, sample, that's a sample eh, size problem. Rate, 70 nonetheless. That means no one saw it. Oh yeah, I saw it. And if you are a fan of the horror genre, I know there's tens of you that are listening. This is, this is pretty good. Not great, but pretty good. Uh, but I bring this up to say that, so the movie was about uh, six friends that went to a haunt, an extreme haunted house. I have no interest in that whatsoever. Kobe and I last year were on a Halloween walk and this was not like an extreme Halloween walk. It was for kids. And I was petrified, petrified. There was people, uh, that you're not sure if they're, if they're, if it's like a a statue or kids hate, kids hate those things. Kobe loved it. He wasn't scared at all. I was freaking out. I was very scared. I was using my phone as a flashlight. I was, he wasn't scared and you were okay. I was very scared. And there was a documentary on Hulu, which I only saw a little bit of. It was very bad. About people, there's people that love extreme haunted houses. Like love. And like there was one where it was just totally over the top. The guy was like torturing his guests. It was, I, I, I get too scared. So that would, that's, that'd be a movie you'd watch, right? A haunted house for Halloween that takes I did watch a little it. too far. That's the movie haunt. That's what I'm saying. Oh, that's what the okay. See, that's what I, I that, could literally write these movies. I could, that, me and Chad GPT could write that, a horror movie. Easily. That's what that's what haunt is. Now, I don't, but I don't think I don't think that I could call myself a horror fan because there's a horror series that I found on. I say found like I discovered it called VHS. There's like six of them. You ever hear of this? No. Okay, it's found footage basically. Blair Witch style. Yeah. Holy shit. Absolute nightmare fuel. The original okay. one in, the original one in 2012, if you like the horror genre, this was super gnarly and really, really scary. Like really, so I, really scary. I have an analogy for your um, movie recommendations, and it's a Seinfeld reference that you probably won't get because you don't watch Seinfeld. But there was an episode where George lost his glasses. And the whole point of the episode was, George, his eyesight would come and go and he could like spot a dime from across the room, but then he picked up an onion and ate it and and it was like, Jerry could, didn't know what to trust. He's like, George is spotting dimes and he's eating onions. They can't tell which which to trust for George because it's like he's spotting a dime from across the room, but he also can't see what's right in front of him. And that's you with your movie takes because- I don't get it. It's like, sometimes he's way off and sometimes he's right on the money. And so you told me to watch Somewhere in Queens with Ray Rano and it's on Hulu. And oh, great I love it. Great I love movie. it. That's what yeah. I'm saying. Some of your takes are you're eating an onion and some of them you're spotting a dime from across the room. Only Seinfeld fans will get this. You know, I but knew you I, would like that movie. Somewhere in Queens was a, was, was a good film. Here's, and one of the things that it had that most movies don't, it had a high school basketball game and the basketball was actually like relatively kid realistic. Was good. Kid was the, good. Kid, the kid, kid could play. And here's my other take. How great, how, how great was the, I forget, the final line that the mom said, was it like, oh, f- that. Yes. <laughs> yes. <It> was, <laughs> I, I love sort of family coming of age movies like that. It, it's just like a regular, normal family and they sort of name. But here's my take. Ray Romano, underrated as an actor. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. I feel like he gets underrated because he was on a sitcom 
uh, and it was like right as sitcoms were kind of tailing off, which I I loved that show. Everyone loves it, but I think he's he's great. All right, fine. Hold hold on, I I got I got to defend my honor on this. Uh, <laughs> oh, I, I get it, I get it. I know I that I crap. like bad movies. It's not it's not like, but but hey, on, VHS is a, is a, is a is a good movie. Uh, but I, it's not like I it's not like I think good movies are bad. I happen to like I have I have I have wide range of tastes. I, yes, you do. So here's my dad of the year. My two daughters and my wife wanted me to go to the Taylor Swift movie with them, the concert eras tour or whatever. This is a three hour long concert movie. Okay. My son lucked out and got to go to a trampoline park for a birthday party instead. So I had to go. We went with some friends and I was bitching and moaning about it all week just to make sure I got my points for this, right? <laughs> like, like, hey, listen, I'm, if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna complain the whole time. And I did complain. <laughs> And uh, it wasn't bad. I, it was definitely way too long for my taste. But was it busy? It was busy. There was no dancing. It, my my daughter was my my oldest daughter Libby is a great dancer and singer, and like she like she like rocks it out a little bit. She has like she's not like self conscious at all, which totally would be me. Yeah. I couldn't do that if unless I had alcohol in me, which I, I kind of respect for her. I'm glad she didn't get that from me. But um, there's not much more you can say about Taylor Swift at this point. But I think the the combination of her being like the girl next door, but also being like literally one of those confident people on the planet is, is just like, it's kind of unbelievable. And the fact that she's been popular for so long, she goes against my thesis of the more rich and powerful you get the, like I, if she keeps this up, I mean, she's kind of like LeBron in a way, like LeBron never got messed up, even though he was started from such a young age. Uh, but think about it. Michael Jackson was totally screwed up. Whitney Houston went off the deep end. The Beatles really were only around for like seven years. Like she, she, her run as like this popular person is just unprecedented historically. It's, she's, it's kind of amazing. And yes. Uh, but anyway, I got dad points for the week. That's all that matters. You know, but I also get self-conscious in public about those sort of things. It's a, it's a, that's not a skill. It's a trait. It's a trait that I wish I had. We, when yes. we were, we went out to uh, a Mexican restaurant and there was mariachi guys that came over and they they sang "Sweet Carolina." You're supposed to swing, sing along with them. I couldn't. I was too embarrassed. Right. My daughter doesn't have, and I'm really glad she has that because I I think that's a great quality to have. That's a great. Not self conscious at all. It's a wonderful quality. All right. What's our new email, Michael? We got a new email. Uh. All right. Listen. I know that this is the people are going to be perturbed because you're used to emailing animalspiritspod at gmail.com, and it was a great email address. It, we had a lot of fun there. So for our regulars, I apologize. Please delete that contact. I don't know how you do it, but just remove it. Get rid of the contact. We have a new email address. It's animal spirits at the compound news.com. Deal with it. Just kidding. I'm sorry if it, if it, uh, Michael's just, angry you know. because everyone says that it's a way worse email. I mean, we had, a, we had a vote internally. It's not just good. No, but listen, uh, people don't like change. I don't like change. Animal spirits at the compound news.com. Sometimes you got to change. All right, send us so an email So I can change, there. and you can change. You know what Rocky said. That was another right. good part about Summer in Queens. He was quoting Rocky the whole movie. That killed me. Good movie. All right, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Duncan, Nicole, John, everybody who helps on the show. Thank you for listening. We will see you next time. <laughs>